Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to have everyone here. It's been a real pleasure getting together in the last three weeks and, and working so closely with the workers. Um, this is a lot of fun, um, and it's a first for all of us. So I'm going to start off by asking everybody to bear with us. Um, thank you in advance for your patience through this. Um, I expect we may hit some glitches here and there, but that may make it more fun and, and more intimate as we visit with um, the artists through the day. And it truly is an, an intimate, intimate visit with the artists. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce my co-hosts, um, Noelle Lamp and Pamela Wakeman. Um, Noelle is the gal Arthur Gorham Paperweight Shop Manager, and Noelle's been years since she received her degree in art history from the Daniel College in Maryland. One of the things that she finds special about working at Wheaton Arts is working with talented artists and knowledgeable collectors from around the globe. And I know she is learning and learning from those collectors and artists as well. Um, Pamela Wakeman came to Wheaton Arts in 2004 as a ceramic artist. Currently, the director of education and artist services, she develops education teams, groups, and at-risk youth, as well as managing our residency programs. She received her formal training in arts and arts administration from Rowan University, Pennsylvania State University, and Jackson University. My name is Marcy Peterson. I've been with Wheaton Arts since 1994. I'm the RIT director, and my undergraduate and graduate studies were in fine art and e-business, marketing, and field. I'm looking for the silver linings in every day, especially right now, and I really appreciate the opportunity to produce this event with the Pam and, and again, all the artists that have been so generous with their time. Thank you, Marcy. Um, that introduction was absolutely wonderful. Hi, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to be here with you today to enjoy a day filled with intimate studio visits with a handful of the best paperweight artists in the field. I have known these artists for many years and have enjoyed their talks and demonstrations at past paperweight fests. However, today, I feel we will really enjoy a new level of engagement with these artists. Before we begin with our studio visits, I would like to share a brief introduction to Wheaton Arts for those who may not be extremely familiar. I'm excited to share with you that Wheaton is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. As many of you know, Wheaton Arts is one of the most unusual and creative landmarks in the Northeast. The organization was founded in 1968 by Frank H. Wheaton with the intention of being a turn of the 20th century glass town destination. The first buildings opened to the public in 1970. 50 years later, Wheaton Arts has become an international hub for artists exploring the limits of their creativity and a reception for the region's cultural diversity. It has additionally earned regional, national, and international recognition for its unique collections and programs. Our mission is to engage artists and audiences in an evolving exploration of creativity. As Marcy mentioned, I run our educational and artist residency programs. I've had the extreme pleasure of developing and implementing programs for all of our audiences. Our educational programs include classes and workshops for people of all ages, including families, students, teachers, and corporate groups, just to name a few. Additionally, we offer on-site guided educational experiences and creative stations, narrated demonstrations focused on glass, ceramics, and paper, and make your own experiences, during which you get to be the artist. Two years ago, we established a small glass fusing program that is situated in our education studio, formerly the stained glass studio for those of you who have been on our site. This program accommodates all the audiences I mentioned above. Our artist residency program has grown significantly over the past five years. It incorporates artists who, um, who have not worked in glass before um, that come on site and they, they broaden their horizons and incorporate glass making into their work. I'm so proud to have witnessed years of programs that promote intergenerational learning. Thank you to all who are joining us today. I'm very excited to begin our day. Over to you, Marcy. Thank you. And I understand that we had a little bit of an echo there. I think that I have solved that, but if I have not, let me know. And just a little housekeeping right now. Um, I'm gonna 
uh, actually read over this, but these are the tech tips. Um, so for you, those of you that are new to Zoom, again, this is a webinar. Only the hosts and the panelists will be heard, and thus only the hosts and panelists will be recorded. You may have noticed that there is a recording button, um, and we hope that people that didn't get to see the whole thing or um, didn't get to come this morning or, or may be on the um, West Coast and it's a little too early, we'll be able to enjoy this at another time. Again, opening the Q&A window allows you to ask the artist and the host questions. They'll try to get to your questions and you can also like or comment other questions and when you do that, it'll um, lift higher so that we know that that's the one to, to ask the host and the artist. Um, should you lose um, connection for any reason whatsoever, please just go right back to your email and sign in. Um, and the only other um, advice I can give in the tech on there is that if um, you are having a problem, just shut down your device and, and start it again. And then click on that link to join. Once again, you can leave the, met, the meeting anytime you like to leave um, and come back. Okay, so at this time, I'm going to start a video. Um, Paul Stankard has joined us from Mantua, New Jersey, and that's just 45 minutes from Wheat Marks. So we have the pleasure of seeing Paul many times during the year, and, and, and we, we all will share the pleasure of talking to Paul today. I'm going to have to stop my screen and restart um, a share, so bear with me, please. Hello. Okay. Welcome, Big Nuts friends. It's awesome to be up in the studio. We're proud to be at Weed Nuts Paperweight Fest. But before we go to the studio, I want to share my forget-me-not blossoms, which are really in full bloom this year. Beautiful commute to your studio. my studio. I moved from a, a small studio attached to the house to, uh, to expanding uh, a studio next door. Um, it's a wonderful commute. I'm very happy here. We have a lot of light, a lot of space. This area is designed for encapsulating the colored, the flame work to color glass designs. And, uh, and that's really, uh, it's really been a joy over the last, I've been sitting behind a, uh, over the last 59 years, I've been sitting behind a torch. Come on, let's go up into this thing working area. And we can unmute Paul now, and we'll be able to hear Paul directly. Well, I'm happy to be here. This is exciting. This is my first uh, Zoom presentation. A um, little background about myself. I've been sitting behind this torch for 59 years, if you can believe that. And I still have a lot of energy for what I'm doing. I graduated in 63, 1963, 
from Salem Vocational Technical School, which is now Salem Community College. And um, worked in the South Jersey glass industry and, was a, and really got excited about the South Jersey paperweights, the, the, the Millville Rose and the Devil's Fire and that, that paperweight experience was exciting. I started experimenting with the paperweights. And um, Charles Kazian was a pioneer and enjoyed his work and Francis Whittemore actually worked for Francis. So what I'm gonna do today is make, uh, make a flower, show you examples of my work and answer questions. So this is gonna be exciting. I'm using a gas oxygen bench burner and I have a lot of the material prep pre-made, but I'll show you uh, one of the basic uh, one of the basic uh, components in my world is making pedals. So here's um, heating up the uh, the pink glass and. Uh, shaping a petal. Paul, you had mentioned um, earlier in our chat that you were um, inspired by Emily Dickinson and Walt Whitman. Can you talk a little bit about that while you do some demoing? Sure. Uh, I've been, um, I've been a, a Walt Whitman enthusiast for 20, 20 some years. I'm actually on the board of trustees at the Walt Whitman House Cultural Center in Camden, New Jersey. I find that very satisfying. But um, recently, I've been exploring the uh, connection between I wanted to bring my work into a transcendental attitude that is Ill, that is uh, expressed through Emily Dickinson's poetry and Walt Whitman's poetry. So it's kind of exciting to think that uh, I can be inspired by the poetry of uh, both Emily Dickinson and Walt Whitman. And it's, it's allowing me to uh, explore a depth of feeling in my work that uh, that I hadn't experienced up till now. You know, I can walk in the woods and experience native flowers, but there's something very exciting about experiencing native flowers through the, the poetry or the paintings and illustrations of other creative people. And uh, so Walt Whitman's take on, especially Walt Whitman, his take on uh, nature is very, 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 uh, has a depth of feeling to it. It's an intelligent, fresh take on uh, the plant kingdom that I'm particularly interested in. So I'm gonna make a flower. I'm gonna use the, uh, uh, let's see here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this. I start from the center. In this case, it will be the pistol of the flower and work out. So, I'm balling up the, uh, the ovaries on the pistol. And then I'm adding uh, a stamen. A fil this is a uh, filament. The stamen consists of a filament and an anther. And I'm putting the filaments onto the uh, center of the flower. You know, for, <laughs> for the longest time, I was trying to interpret nature with a botanical, interpret the botanical characteristics of uh, the 
flowers that were going into my design. And now I'm more interested in capturing the the spirit of the fecundity of a plant, the fecundity of a flower, the beauty of, of the flowering plant. But now my work's referential. So I'm going to trim up stamens <laughs> and uh, are they seeing this pretty clearly, Mossy? Oh, well, are they, are it looks they very seeing clear it? to me. Yeah, it oh, looks very good. good. Um, good. I just wanted to ask you, uh, as we're on the subject of poetry, I know that you are the author of three books yourself. And I believe when we had last chatted, you had talked about potentially writing a fourth book. Did the you book is, a little bit about that? Yeah, the book I, I sent it, the manuscript has been sent to the publisher. The working title is um, A Window into the Soul of an Artist. And it's really about um, kind of a inspiration, offering inspiration to, uh, to create a people to take their work to the next level. And or to uh, and or to um, grow with artistic maturity. So it's kind of exciting. You know, I love, I have a, I have a love-hate relationship to writing. I, I, I'm very proud of my writing, but it's very difficult to do. So it's, uh, I'm adding, I'm adding the, uh, Petals onto the onto the uh, stamens. Okay. Paul, we have a question from one of the um, viewers in the chat room, and they're asking about your actual glass. They're asking what glass you're using. Um, 104, 96, or Boro? I no, this is not Boro silky glass. This is so lime glass, and I I uh, primarily work with gaffer glass uh, from Portland, Oregon. And gaffer glass has uh, teamed up with North Star and they, uh, they relocated from New Zealand to uh, Portland, Oregon. Now this is all sort of line glass. I don't work, I don't, I don't use Borosoke glass for, for my uh, work. Although okay. with, is a, a growing number of young people that are sympathetic to Borosoke glass and are making their models and paperweights out to Borosoke glass. They get a different look. It's a different, it's a different uh, aesthetic in a way. Okay. You know, it's interesting because when I was starting out, the only color in Borosoke glass was blue. Oh. Now they have all these different colors for the Borsoka people. So I just added my fifth petal. Okay. And and what type of flower were you? Um, uh, this is going to be a, a, a fruit blossom. Oh. So I'm thinking of it as a peach blossom. Wonderful. And I'm, uh, I want to add. Uh, as the sepals. So I add a little glass to support, to support the sepals. You know, I, my work's referential, but I'm familiar with the, uh, the, uh, the plant, uh, I'm familiar with the botany of the plant kingdom. You know, it's amazing how um, I've invented a personal vocabulary to express my interest in nature. And, uh, and now with the uh, reference to the uh, poetry of Walt Whitman and Emily Dickinson, 
I, I feel like I'm expressing fresh information uh, in a way that uh, is building on the, not only the paperweight tradition, but uh, the contemporary glass tradition. So that's kind of exciting. Paul, we're getting another question from the chat room. And someone is asking, what is your favorite yellow to use? Yellow color. That? Well, um, I use, um, I use a variety of yellows. I'm not particularly uh, fussy about what yellow it is, as long as it's still wine glass. Okay. I think I think this yellow is uh, uh, right. It's um, gaffer gaffer glass. Uh, I think it's taxi cab yellow. <laughs> these funny funny names for the colors, but. Um, yeah, you know, there's a yellow, yellow can be a, yellow is an interesting color, it's an attractive color, but there are yellows out there that are, uh, that are um, incompatible. I mean, they, there's a lot of technical problems, and I'm not quite sure why, but okay. there can be technical problems with the yellows. We're getting more questions now, Paul. So we have, I know you uh, possibly will be showing us um, a root figure after this. So we're getting some questions about your inspirations, about the, the, the figures in your work and a little bit more, um, any inspiration you can share with us. We're getting sure. a lot of questions about that. <laughs> yeah, the figures are a very important part. It's about myth. The figures started out trying to celebrate the mysteries under the earth. And um, I read a book by uh, Carl Jung, who suggested that there's just as much life energy under the earth as there is above the earth. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. How do you show that? Right. So I started to, uh, I started to play around with the, the human form. Well, the, the, the figures started out as, my reference was the uh, ginseng root. Oh. Uh, the more human form the root took, the more healing, the stronger the healing virtue. Hmm. So they were, it was medicinal herbs. Okay. And then from the, from, uh, and then mandrake was a famous, famous, uh, wood, these came out of the wood cutting. Mandrake is under the human forms under the plant. So I started out making them anthropomorphic, human like, and then got tighter and tighter and tighter. And now I enjoy interacting the human, putting the human form into the design. Very cool. To uh, suggest mystery, I don't. You know, they're, they're just human forms that add. I camouflage them into the uh, into the root system, and there's an oftentimes there's an element of surprise when uh, people look at my work, <laughs> uh, and often there's a underside, and they see the. It appears to be a root, but then they realize it's a human form. That's, that's, been, that's been fun. Yes, that is fun to, to watch pe people experience that for the first time as they're turning it around in their hands and say, hey, is that a figure in there? <laughs> <laughs> so it but is a you mystery. Know, you know, it's really been a journey. I've loved, I love the idea of uh, dedicating my creative energy to this this tradition, the paperweight tradition, and mm -hmm. that evolved from, I was first inspired by the South Jersey paperweight. Then I became uh, a student of the antique French paperweight and also became uh, an enjoyed and, and 
became connected with the Studio Glass movement through teaching. I would teach at Penn Lynn and Pilchuck and Salem and even at, Sa at, at Wheaton. Right. You know, and uh, I, when I think of my career, Wheaton Village and Wheaton Odd has really nurtured my artistic maturity. Wow. The, uh, the experiences that have, uh, that I've gleaned information from mm -hmm. that we not has been really a remarkable resource so you know especially the creative glass center of america i was actively involved in that in the founding days and uh, it's really been a fascinating journey um uh, what else can i say we really work, that's uh, that's wonderful paul Let, let's see if we have any other questions in the chat room if not I have some questions prepared for you. Okay. Um, let's see. People are asking um, if you could tell us how many, basically time, how, how many hours goes into making one piece? Is there oh. a timeline you can share with us? Yeah, I could do this in about an hour and 15 minutes and I get $7,500 for it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Pretty good magic trick, isn't it? <laughs> right. But I think there might be some more involved than that. <laughs> I take, uh, I'm at a very, very comfortable place in my career now. I work, um, oh, I try to make an orb, I try to make about three orbs a month. Okay. And I work, uh, about 20, 25 hours a week by myself. And, wow. and then I bring in Dave Graber and my son Joe, Friday morning, generally, and, and they help me put it together. And it's very salvatory. Uh, there's always a little risk associated with encapsulating the, uh, the components, but uh, it's really been, a, we've been very successful. Now this particular piece is a bouquet, Emily Dickinson garden bouquet. And then the underside, I have the figures. I don't know if you can oh, yes. see the figures. Mm -hmm. I can see them. There. There's a honeybee. So this has, you know, two or 300 hours. Um, it's really, um, you know, I, I want the labor, I want my labor to be invisible. I don't want people to think, oh my God, he's laboring right. with that. Look at how laborful. You know, I mean, I just want it to look intelligent, you know. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of a lot of training, a lot of skill, a lot of inventiveness that goes into the work. So to answer the question, I'd say a couple hundred hours. I'd say that's fair, Paul. Um Plus many, many trial and error uh, sessions, I'm sure, too, right? <laughs> well, you know, you, you have to, yes. Yes. <laughs> risk, you know, I've always enjoyed taking risks with my work because when I succeed, I have something very special. I'm really not, you know, I'm not focused on production as much as trying to um, make things special. Uh, it's about an idea. Currently, the, the poetry celebrating uh, Whitman and Emily Dickinson's poetry into the glass. Uh, I've been trying to understand how I can do that. Other than you know, the beauty of the is an intelligence to beauty. I feel fortunate that I work in glass and I have such a, a, a wide menu, such a varied menu of colors. It, you know, I have the glass can be translucent, it can be opaque. That's right. So I really enjoy that. Uh, awesome. The idea that I can interpret nature with the, and interpret the plant kingdom with the glass. Um, yeah. We have another question? question, Paul. Yeah. Yes, we have another question. Someone was asking, which I thought was really interesting. They're asking what art or items that you have placed around in your studio give you inspiration? So I think that's 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 really interesting that we know you well, 
of your my, space? Like yeah, a gallery. My, <laughs> well, I enjoy painting. Uh, I enjoy, actually, uh, I enjoy abstract expressionism. You know, it's funny because a friend of mine came into the studio, saw my abstract expressionist paintings, and said, geez, I would think that you would be more about realism. I said, no, I'm, I'm banging my head against the wall trying to make my, trying to make my artwork bring the illusion of realism to my artwork, but right. I don't know I do it. surrounded <laughs> by realism. But uh, poetry, literature has been a very, very satisfying inspiration and, and uh, source, of, source of inspiration, source of uh, advancing my creative ideas, especially the poetry. Uh, it's really been, you know, um, Interesting, I was found, you know, as an artist, here I am, 77 years old. Thinking young, about 77 years young. <laughs> 77 years young, okay. <laughs> and I'm fascinated with my childhood memories. And I'm trying to ca capture those memories in a way that will celebrate, that I can advance it into the future. You know, I, I've been experimenting. I just finished experimenting and executing uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, pink lady slipper. Oh, beautiful. And I have a pink lady slipper, and I wrote an essay about the pink lady slipper. Oh, uh, audience, if you go on my website, uh, paulstanker.com, go to writing, and I have uh, my essays about the pink, I have a nice essay that I wrote about the pink lady slipper. And discovering it in the woods and bringing it home to my mom and oh. learning learning it was a rare orchid. But um, So even as a child, you were fascinated with botanicals and... Yeah, isn't that interesting? I think that yeah. uh, many artists, they go back to their childhood interests. But, you know, over the years, I've brought a bit of, a, I've been obsessed with this. Really. It's been an obsession. And I'm not saying it in a negative way. I'm just saying it the way it was, the way it has been. You know, I've been, I've been really dedicated my life to interpreting uh, the plant kingdom in glass and encapsulating it and invented illusions. It's all about inventing illusions. And I think that from paperweights to cubes to the botanical forms, the rectangular blocks, the right. columns, and then orbs, I really have uh, enjoyed presenting my take on nature in ways that uh, bring a fresh, I would like to think, uh, a fresh to uh, art making. Absolutely. And speaking so. of illusions, Paul, we've been getting a couple of questions from the audience members about your honeybees. Oh, the honeybees. Are just absolutely amazed how they appear to be floating in the glass. So we're getting some questions about the um, technical aspects of how the honeybees float in the glass. Well, there's two ways to present the honeybees in my crystal clear glass. One to balance one on a flower. Uh, Friday yesterday, Friday morning, uh, Dave, Joe and I were working and uh, Dave made, uh, finished off a honeybee. And I said, let's, I'm going to balance this on the flower and I'm going to risk it all. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're looking at this, <laughs> looking at this bee precariously balanced on the top of a glass flower, glass bee on top of a glass flower. And, I, and uh, when we encapsulated it, Dave said, Paul, we have it. You got it. Look at that. <laughs> we got it. So I'm I can't wait to see how the honeybee is. And, is balanced on the tip of a collecting nectar on this glass flower. Wow. But you know, the That's idea amazing. of bringing, uh, bringing other elements into my designs, honeybees, damselflies, uh, ants. I, for the longest time, I, I did ants. Right. Uh, I do remember funny, that. I did a lot. I did, I would put a lot of, I put ants into the designs and uh, my daughter was making them, Kathy. So she went to be a teacher. And so, <laughs> That was the end of the ants because I didn't want to, 
And it's funny because nobody ever said anything about, oh, you're not doing amps anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of people thought it just looked natural, you know? Right, they did, they did. It's accepted for, you know, for what it was. <laughs> but uh, no, the, everything is, is, it's about, it's, it's labor intense, but really you want to hide, I want to hide my labor. Right. I just want it to be intelligent. And I think that's what my whole career has been about, presenting the, it's difficult because I'm, to, to capture the, the beauty of a blossom or beauty of a plant, in an intelligent way in glass. I mean, you have to invent all these techniques to do that. And, uh, you know, the sure. French were more fanciful. Mm -hmm. It was stylized, fanciful right. work. And then when I came in the 70s, when I, I was influenced by Woodmore and Cassian as, as far as making paperweights. But soon after I started making paperweights, I wanted to interpret native flowers. And I stayed with that theme. It's funny, I mean, talk about an artist being a little upset. <laughs> <laughs> I've been focused on native flowers for, God. Well, for you, you do it so well. I think that you do it so well, it's your niche and when well it's what i feel is important, it's important right and me, and it comes yeah. through it comes through is that is your passion and you execute it so beautifully that it is magical it's a magical experience for someone to view your work especially for the first time and not yeah. any of the labor behind it it's just Thank seems you. effortless so you know um, wonderful really really um and i guess it was 1969 I was experimenting with paperweight making and I took a ride to Millville, New Jersey to the Arthur Gorham paperweight shop. <laughs> and I had a chance to meet Arthur Gorham and then about a few years later, he donated his collection and the paperweight shop was transferred to the village. Yes, yes. But uh, did you ever meet Arthur Gorham? I did not have that pleasure, no, Paul. Yeah, he, he was no. a very nice man, yeah. Yeah. But you know, uh, the, the wheat knots, has really uh, advanced this whole paperweight tradition in a very special way. And, yes, uh, I would have observed, especially the, the paperweight weekends that we've had every other year, the wonderful people that travel from all over to come sure. to, to see the artists. And it's, it's just a wonderful group of people that we, we really appreciate and, um, you know, thank, thank you. Know, the thing, the thing that I've been uh, benefited from is the furnace working, the hot work, the factory that you call it the factory. It's where the molten glass is uh, blown. I tried very hard over my career to integrate other processes beyond flame working process into right. my into my floor into my glass uh, casting, enameling, uh, coal working. I mean, it's really. Um, the flame working process is at some some of my designs is it's about half flame working and half other processes right and i think that's and that's one of the great benefits that i've uh, one of one of the benefits i derived from being so close to we knots and interacting with all the other artists mm -hmm. that's really true fun. yeah that is true we have um a couple more questions paul okay and a couple of them are actually the same, um, the same essence. Um, well, I can repeat myself. <laughs> no, no. Uh, what advice would you give to up and coming paperweight artists? We've got well, a couple of those questions. Well, I think it's a wonderful field. It's about, it's about making it special, making it personal. It's about, you have to, because paperweight, the best of the paperweights are, there's a, there's a, a qual. There's, how do I say it? There's um, a parameters quality. Okay. The collective the collective paperweights are. They're looking for. They don't want bubbles. They don't want things smudgy. Uh, you know, there's um, just to to make the work personal. 
regardless. It doesn't have to be a flower. It doesn't have to be an animal. It can be anything you want it to be. Uh, try to put it into some sort of art historical context, you know. Uh, I studied uh, the history of floral art and studied uh, art history. Right. Uh, so it's just really educate yourself to excellence. And whether it be, there's a connection between an excellent painting or an excellent sculpture and an excellent paperweight. It's really fascinating. So if you wanted to make paperweights, um, take two, it's going to take you four or five years to really master that craft and to, okay. and, and, and you'll slowly make it personal and then you'll find your audience. Okay. I think that your wheat knots, your, you, Noel, as a dealer and other dealers will promote the artist aesthetic in a way that will, will identify and grow their audience. I think it's going to be hard to make flower paperweights uh, with, I don't know. I, I mean, if you have to make them, you're going to have to make them a little different than what I'm doing. Right. Sure. I and I think everybody um, has their own passion. So whatever, whatever subject matter or, you know, whatever that they um, are drawn to and inspired by, they should go in that direction rather than, you know. That's a good point. Yeah, well, right. You know, also, there's collector's weights, you know, there's, uh, there's kind of serious paperweight mm -hmm. collectors that are spending serious money and building important collections that will find their way into museums someday. There's a lot of connoisseurship that goes into that work. And I think originality is an important component and, and uh, craftsmanship to, Certainly. Has to be made well. So, you know, um, I think that. Uh, there's always a there's always a um, respect and demand for for quality work. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers some of the young people's questions. It just you know um, uh, forget the uh, forget the author, the the author's name, but generally it takes about ten thousand hours to, to become a. <laughs> Uh, Gladwell. No, no, what was his name? Gladwell. What was his first name? Uh, anyway. I don't know, Paul. Ma Ma Malcolm Gladwell. Malcolm, thank oh. you. Thank, thank you, Pam. Malcolm Gladwell. <laughs> One of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, Malcolm Gladwell uh, wrote a book on, on, uh, on mastering your craft, and he claims, regardless of what it is, it generally takes a person 10,000 hours to really make it uh, exceptional and to wow. and to make it personal so that's the key i mean you, but you, but the challenge is how do you support yourself on that journey along that journey so you just right. have to um, persevere, persevere. <laughs> well paul i think we have one minute left so let's see if we have any other questions um, from our audience and um, we've had a couple of questions about the elements and um, how you keep the components warm. Do you use a, a special hot plate? We yeah, I actually have a, I have a, when I make complex blossoms, like, uh, let me share this with you. So these are some of the more complex blossoms that I make. Oh, wow. And it's got a, a it's got a, a complex pistol with stamens around it, and it's three layers of petals with sepals. So this, uh, this actually would take, you know, it's a little, once I start, it takes me about 45 minutes to sculpt it out. But then it goes, right to, it goes right to the annealing of it. I anneal it. And then over the course of the week, my, my components are annealed in a little oven, and then I, put them back in the oven, bring it up to temperature, transfer it to a hot plate with a Bunsen burner under it. And then I design I, with a hand torch. You know, a lot of you, a lot of the uh, collectors can go on YouTube. And uh, I have a lot of different uh, posts. People have, have um, filmed me 
in my okay. process. Mm -hmm. So it's all on YouTube. Okay. So it's really, uh, it's really fascinating how when I started out, <clears throat> paperweight making was very secretive. But today, it's uh, wide open, but yet, uh, it's beyond it <laughs> to make it special. It's a little right. bit beyond, beyond the craft. <laughs> All right, Paul. Well, thank you. Thank yes. you, and thank you, audience, for thank you, Paul, for letting me letting me share my my process with you and my talk. Thanks so Paul, much. So good good luck with your your seminar. Your not a seminar. Your webinar. Webinar. <laughs> webinar. <laughs> thank you, Paul. <laughs> thank you for allowing allowing into your studio today and sharing some of your inspiration. And we thank you so much. <laughs> okay, bye bye. And we're and gonna I'm, throw it over to Marcy. Paul, I'm going to show some of the, um so show some of your weights now. And I wanted to also thank you for sharing you sharing the space with us. But um I think that the thing that everyone really is appreciating about this is that this perspective into your work and to get up close in a demo like this is something that has been it, it is unique now and um that that in the normal realm you would not be able to see exactly that's what technology is taking advantage of current technology Marcy. and i hope we will do maybe we'll do another project i hope well i i think that's um we definitely have the um questions for that um <clears throat> and we have a lot um of questions left over, so <laughs> um, that may be may may be a possibility. Fantastic! Thanks so very very much. Thank you, Paul. Well, bye -bye. We'll be starting this um, over again. Bye now, Paul. Bye. -bye.